Okay, so we're going to connect the DT-466 International engine up to an exhaust system now so that we can remove any of the spent gases from the engine so that it's going outside. So in this particular case, we have overhead ventilation, we have an adapter to be able to clamp it on, and this particular manufacturer uses a downspout or a forward spout, so it makes it kind of hard to connect it, but we're just going to use a bungee cord onto the exhaust and then support it so that when it's operating any exhaust gases can leave the engine. So the next thing we're going to take a look at is the controls of operation. We need to know how to shut it off and we need to know how to throttle it so that we have control of it while it's running. So on this particular engine and in the chassis we'd either have a cable control or a solenoid with an actuator lever on it to open and close the fuel shutoff lever which brings the rack back to a no fuel position which shuts down the available fuel to the injectors. So that's how we're going to be able to shut it off and then we need to have control over it while it's running. So we can use the throttle lever to throttle and increase or decrease the RPM based on the test. Okay, two other things we're just going to have a quick look at here is the throttle backstop back into the idle position. We have an adjuster on here so we can adjust the low idle setting on this particular pump to maintain manufacturer specifications into a plus or minus rating of appropriate engine RPM at idle. Then we have the wide open stop and sometimes we have to break off this tab and make it adjustable so that we can control wide open throttle application or full throttle application. And again this one is going to be used to control bottom end or pardon me the low end idle and this one's going to be to control the high end idle or wide open throttle application. So either one may need to be adjusted to fall within manufacturer specs. And Okay, next thing we're going to do is, on this particular engine, it's a lab engine, we're going to actually hook up a remote fuel supply. So just like you would see in the truck, the one line is going to return back to the top of the tank and one needs to be picked up off the bottom of the tank. So all we're going to do here is put the return line onto the, refuel, onto the return fuel line on the back of the engine and that allows excess fuel that's not being used to come back to the return side of the uh, fuel system. Then the supply line we're going to connect directly to the filter header so that we have ample supply at that area. So I've gone ahead and I've loosened off this fitting because we need to hook up an engine oil pressure gauge and this one's going directly into the main rifle gallery which is the volume supply gallery for the engine and again this is our sensor that would normally be in that position. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is install a engine oil pressure gauge into that area so that I can monitor the engine oil pressure during running. So I can also report the low idle setting and the high idle setting. And again, we will go ahead and just snug that up and then tighten it down with a wrench so that we don't have any leaks. So we take a look at the engine oil pressure gauge. We have 80 PSI on it and we can read small increments up to a 20 in one pound increments and then in two pound increments right up to 80 PSI. So we're going to hang this on the engine in an appropriate position so that when I run the engine I can monitor its uh, values. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, heavy duty voltage leads from our battery cart and we're going to connect it directly to the starter motor on this particular lab engine. So we have a bus bar connected here to get some of the uh, power connections away from the starter so that we don't potentially have any arcing. On Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our remote starter so that I can hand hold this unit and then crank the engine to check the operation and to crank it to start it. So we're going to make the connection directly on the battery positive and then we're going to go to the S terminal on the starter motor. We also have another terminal here which is the ground which grounds the pull in hold in winding of the starter and we want to send or simulate the signal of the key switch going directly to this starter motor. So we're bypassing chassis wiring and then in a sense hot wiring it so that we can start use this starter motor to crank the engine. 
So when we turn the battery on, we're just going to check our connection and make sure that we do have supporting power to be able to crank and run. So depending on the manufacturer of the engine depends on what type of bleeding methods that we have available on the pump. This manufacturer in some cases depending on the year of an application of the engine has a small bleed screw on the back side of the pump so we can bleed the body of the pump where the pumping elements are and then that will bring us full to the delivery valves. This one doesn't have it, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to crank the engine, now having fuel supply, and we're going to crack each one of the injector lines to see if we actually have fuel pressure there. Then we would move up to the top of the engine, right to the injector lines, and we'd start at the furthest one. Even though the lines are the same size, we're going to start at the furthest one and work our way forward. And all we're going to do is go in and crack that line, crank the engine. When we see fuel, we can close the line. Now, a lot of technicians will go through, even though these engines typically self-bleed, they don't self-prime, but they self-bleed themselves once they get up and running, but we'll run it and then we'll crack the injectors to ensure that all the air is out of the system so that when it goes back to the customer, if it was in chassis, then we would see and know that the fuel system is working correctly. So what we would do in this particular case when we are going to go ahead and start bleeding the fuel system out, knowing now that we've got fuel at the fuel pump, then we would crack the injector line, crank the engine, and wait until we see fuel. As soon as we see fuel, we can snug it back up. Now these need to be torqued to manufacturer specification after the fuel system has been bled out or after you've got the, the unit up and running. Back. So at this particular point we've gone ahead and we've bled out the fuel system and we have ample fuel supply at the top. We have ample fuel supply coming out of the delivery valves and now we should be able to go ahead and start the engine knowing where the fuel shutoff is and knowing where the throttle is to be able to start and run the engine. And then we're going to go ahead and crank and hopefully start the engine. when it's running if I want to go and I want to crack the fuel injectors to make sure that I get all the fuel out. And you can hear the difference in the engine when it starts to stumble. And we can see that we've got fuel coming out of the top of the injector delivery line. Noting the engine oil pressure at idle, 52 pounds, and then a wide open throttle momentarily. And it varies the scale at 80 PSI. The engine slightly cold, so the pressure is going to be quite a bit higher at cold RPM. Now being able to go ahead and shut the engine down, we just push back the fuel shutoff. The next thing would be is if in the event the engine ran away, in a runaway condition, um, does happen. It usually happens when we start messing around with uh, delivery valves or internals on a pumping device or even on some different variations of injectors. So what we don't want to have happen is to go into full rack position which our shutoff would normally be controlling. So when we move the rack back it shuts the fuel off. When we turn it, push it down, that allows us to use the throttle and manually move the rack based on turbo boost pressure and then the position of the throttle itself. So in the event that we have a related fuel system problem, we could get a runaway condition which would cause the engine to continually climb an RPM with no control of shutting it off or throttle response. And in that particular case, it can become very dangerous. So what I'm gonna demonstrate is how to effectively snuff out or snub out a running diesel engine with a CO2 fire extinguisher. So we have to have a CO2 fire extinguisher available and down in the truck shop here for uh, the purpose of having it available we have one designated particularly just for this purpose so that when students start engines there's always a safe operating condition by being able to shut that engine down in the event of an emergency. Okay, so when we're looking at the engine on the opposite side of the engine, we have the turbocharger, the exhaust manifold, 
And there's two portions to the turbocharger. The rear portion, which is the turbine, and it's driven by hot expanding gases leaving and going past the turbine wheel, spooling it up to available manufactured specification for speed, and then pressure, which comes out of the compressor. The compressor is linked directly to the turbine housing or the turbine itself within the housing. And then it goes through the center section where the bearing is, supplies it with oil pressure, and then dumps the excess oil back to the pan. So when the turbine spools up, it spools up the compressor wheel, which gives us charge air to the intake manifold, which we now call as charge air or boost pressure. So this particular engine is not after-cooled, so we only allow hot air, hot compressed gas, or hot compressed air to actually go to the intake. Engines become way more efficient when we can actually cool down the compressor pressure, and that makes it more cool and condensed to put a better charge of fuel in with a colder, cooler, dense charge of air. So this particular engine, we've got a protective cover over the intake of the compressor housing so that we don't have anything get caught in there. So what I want to do is I want to dump the CO2 fire extinguisher directly into the intake or the compressor portion. Normally there would be a hose coming off here and going to our filtration housing or device. So here because we're in the lab setting we're just going to blow it into here and hopefully we get the result we're looking for being able to snuff out a high running engine and then being able to start it right back up. The problem with using a dry powder fire extinguisher um, is that if we were to put that into the engine, now all that dry powder will go directly into the inside of the engine, it'll go all through the compressor of the turbo, and then it'll go directly into the engine itself, creating a hydraulic lock um, from taking up the space in the engine or causing you to actually have to take it completely apart and clean it put it back together and inspect the components. So with the CO2 fire extinguisher, we can snuff it out and we can start it right back up immediately, uninterrupted from its original operation. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start the engine. And I'm gonna bring the RPM up fairly high, which would support, in a sense, a runaway condition. Okay, and now we should be able to go right back, pull the trigger, and start the engine again. You can see it takes very, very little to actually deplete the oxygen and cause the engine to stop running. And again, starting it right back up uninterrupted. So that's some of the operational guidelines that we want to adhere to when we're running a lab engine or even in the chassis to make sure that you protect yourself protect the equipment, and you end up with a good job at the end of the day. Uh, 